He did hit me too, right? Mm -hmm. So McLaughlin did not want to. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, Acts 19. I'm going to read uh, three short readings, 1 through 7, verse 17, and verse 20. So, Acts 19, verses 1, it says, It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper course, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be an Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. And then verse 17 says, This was known to all the Jews and Greeks, also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And then finally, verse 20 says, So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Again, God will bless that reading of this precious word. Now, I want to kind of title this uh, talk this uh, morning, The Name of the Lord Jesus Was Magnified. It's interesting, I was with um, an Indian brother last weekend at uh, the Breaking of Bread, and he got up to share, and that's kind of fairly typical when they do this, in Indian brethren, they usually begin by saying, the name of the Lord Jesus be magnified. I like that. And the idea is this, that what they're going to share, hopefully, will magnify the Savior. So they usually just say that, and of course, things can become routine, but... I, I thought really good that we should want him to be magnified. What do they mean by the name of the Lord Jesus be magnified? Well, when you magnify something, you make something appear bigger than it actually appears to be. And it's good that in our world, the Lord Jesus is not viewed as somebody really significant in a lot of people's minds. Our goal is to magnify the Lord Jesus so people get a bigger picture of who he is. And that's certainly uh, our prayer for this morning and our prayer every time somebody stands on this platform. I hope the desire is the name of the Lord Jesus would be magnified. Anyway, verses 1 through 7, we've got these John's disciples again. And uh, I was thinking, how could you explain this? Remember we said the book of Acts is a book of transition. And I was thinking about a light meter. You know, a light meter kind of is an indication of how much light there is. So I want to think about the book of Acts. And when we come to the Gentiles, according to the light meter, they don't have much. In fact, they're th those that were once are far off, right? So they're far away from, they're in heathen darkness. And then you have the Jews. Well, they've got a lot more light. They've got the Old Testament. They've got two-thirds of the story. They just need the rest of the story. And then you have John's disciples, who even have a bit more light because they've res responded to the ministry of John the Baptist, looking for, repenting in expectation of coming of Messiah, so they have more light, and then you get the Christians, and they're walking in the full all light of divine revelation. Okay, So that's kind of an idea of the transition. So we, we meet people in the book of Acts with different levels of light. And so we meet these people called John's disciples, and they've got a lot more light than most, but they still need the rest of the story. And so that's why we have them uh, popping up in the book of Acts to help us to see this time of change and transition. And so it says that uh, Paul, he comes to Ephesus, uh, as he promised, he said in chapter 18 that he was going to come back to them. And uh, here he is coming back uh, on this new missionary journey. And when he's there, he finds certain disciples. Now, we've got to be careful about the word disciple because um, it's used not just of Christians. Back in John 9, 28, the Pharisee says, we be Moses' disciples. Okay? There are people 
who are Satan's disciples. Right? It just means a learner from a teacher, somebody who's put themselves under some teacher and given themselves over to be instructed by them. And so here we have these, he says, he clearly can see their disciples. And yet he sees something lacking in these disciples because he asked the question. He said to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? So he knows they believe something, but he knows there's something missing. It should be evident to people that we have the Holy Spirit within us, right? If you're a true believer, you're under new management. And you have living within you an indwelling heavenly guest. And your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you ought to be able to notice that. Uh, I knew somebody and they told me that their dad, uh, if they were in a restaurant, he would be able to go up to somebody and he would know immediately if they were a Christian. He said he was never wrong. It's amazing, huh? He could tell. I mean, before he even said a word, he could tell just by looking, this is a Christian. I wonder, could people tell by looking at us? I hope they could. Wouldn't that be nice? Mm -hmm. If they could just say, there's something about that person. Because that something is that the Spirit of God lives here. Yeah. That's a different thing. So it says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? They said, we've not even so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. I, I think perhaps the idea is this. Maybe it would be un unusual for somebody who was Jewish to not have heard of the Holy Spirit told you that he exists. It would be very unusual for somebody who's a disciple of John to not have heard of the Holy Spirit, because didn't John say that that was one coming after him who would baptize them with the Holy Ghost and with fire? And so maybe the real question is this: Have have do you understand about Pentecost? Have you? That's what he said. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Uh, and they said, "We've not switched so heard." And maybe their thought is this: uh, We didn't know the Holy Spirit was given. We we didn't know that He had come. You see, they they got. Uh, under John's teaching, responded to it, and then came to Ephesus, and they didn't know that Pentecost had happened. And so he could see, see there was something missing. And so he says unto them, uh, he said, uh, verse 3, he said to them, unto what then were you baptized? Here's another interesting question. The assumption is that disciples will have been baptized. Isn't that an interesting question? He, he, he doesn't assume, he, just the assumption is, if you're a disciple, you will have shown your discipleship by being baptized. But let me just say this, the idea of an unbaptized believer is completely foreign to the New Testament. It, it's, part, it's actually the beginning of the life of discipleship, isn't it? And so he says, what, uh, so they, they respond about well, John's baptism. And so he says unto them, then said Paul, John verily baptized with baptism of repentance, saying unto the people they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. In other words, his baptism was a preparatory baptism, showing their repentance in expectation of the coming of the Messiah, and that Messiah is none other than Christ Jesus. And it tells us when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? Instant obedience. I like that. No probation period. The day they heard it, believed it, they were baptized. That's wonderful. I'd love to see that. Instant obedience. And so there they are. They're baptized. And so it says, verse 6, And when Paul had laid his hands on them, it says, The Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So this is very interesting. Of course, um, our Pentecostal friends love verses like this. They would say that it's possible to be a believer, and uh, you need a second baptism of the Holy Spirit, and sometimes it can be given by the laying on of hands and all this, and they get all carried away with this kind of thing, and, and they really like this. But actually, let me just say a couple of things. First of all, this is the last incidence of tongues we've encountered in the book of Acts. We want to see another example of tongues after this one. And actually, they don't occur that often, even in Acts. In Acts 2, it was given on the day of Pentecost to repentant Jews. 
In Acts 10, it was the gift of tongues was given to Cornelius' household so that the Jews who were watching could see that God was accepting these Gentiles on the same basis as they accepted Jews. So it was, again, there were Jews present when it took place. And here are John's disciples, yet another group, who are now all, in a sense, being admitted into the one body on different backgrounds. Jews, Gentiles, John's disciples, all coming into that one body. Where do we get that from? We've just been spending the weekend or to now studying 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, a little bit of 14, but in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, it says this, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we Jews or Gentiles, bond or free, we have all been made to drink into that one spirit. And so the idea is this, that these former John's disciples are now being baptized into that one body by the spirit. And um, of course, on the Corinthians, it's interesting, uh, they were not there on the day of Pentecost. But Paul says to them, by one spirit, are we all baptized into the body? How did that happen for them? Did somebody lay hands on the Corinthians? Don't read that. I believe it happened the day they trusted in Christ. They came into all the good of not only what Christ did on Calvary, but all the good of what happened on the day of Pentecost. And that's what happens to us. The day we were saved, we're placed into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit's placed into us, and all of the good of Calvary and Pentecost becomes ours, even though we weren't physically present on either day. In the mind of God, we were, and we go into the good of it. Now, here's just one other thing we need to mention, perhaps, which is really important. Again, in 1 Corinthians 12, and we'll, we'll just break it in verse 29. He's asking the Corinthians some questions, and here are the questions. Are all apostles? Now, what answer do you think he's expecting from the Corinthians? Is, is every believer an apostle? No. No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracle? No. Have all give the feeling? No. And here's the big punchline. Do all speak with tongues? The answer is no. And yet every Corinthian believer had been baptized into that one body, but not all of them spoke with tongues. So it cannot be an evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because not every one of them spoke with tongues. And I think that's important for us to understand. By the way, neither were they all spiritual. But the Corinthian assembly was known for its carnality. So interesting, isn't it? So uh, this baptism, all it does is places you into the body of Christ and places the Holy Spirit into you. It's an amazing event, but it happens the day you're saved. But it doesn't guarantee that you'll be a spiritual believer. It gives you all the potential to being a spiritual believer because you have the spirit of the living God living within you. And if you yield to him, you can be a spiritual believer. You have all the potential. But you can still make some rotten, rotten choices and choose to live in the flesh. Don't make those choices. But we can still do it. So just a little application of this section. This is really just uh, uh, kind of showing the importance of certain things. First of all, it's important to understand progressive revelation. That's really important. Uh, and even progress of understanding. Book of Acts, you know, there are people at different levels of understanding. They need different treatments. It's important to see that in the wider context. Need to need to grasp the transitional nature of the book of Acts. And although nobody could say in our assemblies, we've not so much as heard of the Holy Spirit. Is it evident to everybody that we're walking in that Holy Spirit? It is evident that we're enjoying the good of the Spirit of God. I hope that it is. And so that's just a challenge to us. We want to move on to the excited part now of We want to move on to the excited part now of this passage. And I think it really is an exciting section. Now, we're really going to see in this section uh, how the gospel progresses tremendously, how the Lord is magnified, how the word of the Lord 
uh, grows mightily and prevails. But we're going to see that this growth is despite opposition. We're going to see it's despite the opposition from three particular avenues. Firstly, the opposition from the religious world. And we're going to see that there's some possibility in the synagogue. The religious world is opposed to the message of Christ being preached. And then we're going to see that it's opposed by the spirit world. Uh, we're going to see about these, uh, these evil spirits uh, that know Jesus and know Paul, but they didn't know the sons of Sceva. So we're going to see that the opposition in, from the spirit world. And then finally, at the end of the chapter, we're going to see the opposition from the business world. Because Ephesus, although it had a harbor, by the time that Paul arrived there, this harbor was pretty much silted up. And so its main business was tourism. And the tourism was surrounding the goddess Diana. In crowds flocked to see the temple of Diana, great is Diana of the Ephesians, this temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And so it was magnificent, spectacular. And people came there, and when they went there, just like today, tourists like to take home some trinkets with them. So how many of you got ever seen people with the Eiffel Tower, you know, that they have in, we actually have one, I don't know where we got it from, but we have one, uh, and, and all this kind of stuff, you know, this is where I went, you know, the Grand Canyon or whatever, a fridge magnet. Uh, so you went to Ephesus, you came away with a silver model of the Temple of Diana or of Diana herself. And you took your little trinket home with you. And if you were a, a worshiper of the goddess, well, you stuck it on the shelf and bowed down and worshipped it. And so Paul is going to basically put the tourist industry in Ephesus out of business. And the business world doesn't like it. It's kind of interesting. The uh, first martyr of the Salvation Army was a wee lassie. And she was so effective in Brighton, England, that the pubs were losing trade. And the local landlords, owners of the pubs, hired a mob to deal with this woman, and they stoned her to death. Interesting. Business hates the gospel when it cuts right out. We were as we were driving here, we, we passed them uh, on Sunshine a couple of these adult entertainment places, and we have to pray, Lord, put them out of business. But I look at if the gospel put them out of business. When that was, you see, when revival comes, a lot of things like that happen. Places dealt with iniquity. Of course, with that comes opposition because the people who run those businesses hate the message that is actually putting them out of business. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the pornography industry went out of business in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be wonderful if the abortion industry went out of business in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. This would be wonderful. Well, that's what's happening in Ephesus. This is a mighty, the, the word of the Lord is being magnified here, and business is shutting down as a result of it. And so, um, as we uh, consider uh, the opposition and yet the Lord being magnified, then of course, it's, the, the, the word of the Lord is being, Jesus is being magnified, by it being clearly taught in verses 8 through 10, uh, when Christ preach, uh, Paul preaches that in the synagogue, and then in verse 11 through 17, when um, apostolic miracles were done in his name, and then in verse 18 through 20, when Christians get serious about dealing with sin. These are ways in which the word of the Lord is magnified. So let's look at verses 8 through 10. And it begins this way, it says, and he went into the synagogue, of course, he had been there before. Look at chapter 18 and verse 19. He came to Ephesus, left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews when they desired him to tarry longer time with them. He consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep the feast, so on and so forth. And, he, and so he says, but I will return unto you. And so here's his return. This is his promised return. He's now entered into the same synagogue at Ephesus. And they said, we, we want to hear more. Uh, they, they wanted to stay longer. And so now he's come back and he is speaking boldly for the space of three months, disputing 
and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when thy verse were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years. And all which dwell in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So great things happening here. Uh, first of all, he goes in the synagogue just as he had promised to do. Uh, but if we notice there's a mixed response. Even though initially they wanted to hear more, uh, the more they hear, the less they want to hear. And they harden themselves against the word of God. And that's a very serious thing. Not only the fact that they hardened their own selves against the word of God, but they spoke evil of that way. See, it's one thing to reject Christ. It's a whole nother level when you speak evil of that way. And that's what they were doing, sadly. And of course, we know that the Jews would become judicially blinded because of their uh, their rejection of the light. If you turn your back on the light, you always end up in darkness. And they were given the light. It was brought to them. Uh, it was boldness, uh, persuasiveness, all of this. They hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way. And so Paul separates them and he goes into this school of, of uh, Tyrannus. Now, I want to just say something about this because this verse has been used to justify Bible schools. See, Paul started a Bible school in the school of Tyrannus. And he certainly taught there for two years. But I, I think it's just reading a little bit into the text. Let me just say this. What the school of Tyrannus was, was a meeting place where Paul did evangelistic testimony from. It's more like a gospel place where for two years he preaches the word of God, disputing daily in the school of Tyrannus. And so he hired this school. Now, it's kind of amazing when you think of it, because uh, he stayed in that school uh, for two years, and it says, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. Clearly, his purpose there is purely evangelistic, and it was effective. People came there, they disputed, they heard the word of God, and there was a great work done uh, throughout uh, Asia. And, and of course, when we think of Asia, we're not thinking, you know, the Philippines and all, we're talking Asia Minor, Turkey, where the seven churches are. This is kind of the region that we're talking about where this takes place. Now, here's just another thought. Some, some have suggested that he would, now where they got this from, I have no idea, perhaps from uh, Josephus or somewhere, I don't know, but they, they reckon that he was there from 11 to 4 every day except the Sabbath day. Now, I don't know where they get it from, but it's interesting. If that was the case, in that two years, there would have been 3,130 hours of biblical instruction. That would have been quite the thing, wouldn't it? Uh, but certainly God used it. Not only did God use this ministry to cause all which dwell in Asia to hear the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks, but he also says in verse 11, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. By the way, miracles by their very nature, are unusual. They're, 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 they're not everyday occurrences. And these were unusually unusual. They were very special miracles. And he describes some of the miracles, verse 12, so that from his body were brought onto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. And of course, Paul tells us what this is all about in 2 Corinthians 12. Let's look at a couple of verses here. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 12, he says this, Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you, in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So these these special there were signs of it was a kind of a way of showing the apostolic authority of the apostle Paul that he did these miracles in the name of the Lord Jesus. Look at Hebrews two just to see again this uh, evidence of this. Uh, 
Hebrews 2, verse 3 and 4. He says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. By the way, these signs, notice he was ministering to both Jews and Greeks in verse 10. And he said, God wrote special miracles by the hands of Paul. The reason I'm emphasizing the Jews and Greeks is that the Jews required a sign. And so I would suggest to you that particularly this evidential signs have the Jews in mind. Showing them God is indeed doing a new thing and vindicating the claims of the one who died and is risen again. And so there was a very real reason for that. In verse 13, though, we find something again quite remarkable. It says, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preached. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and chief of priests, which did so. Now, the Jews practiced exorcism. We know that. Uh, how do we know that? Well, let's look at Matthew 12. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, just to say this was a practice among the Jews, uh, the practice of uh, casting out demons. It says in verse 27, Jesus says, if I by Beelzebub, which is what they accused him of, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. So it's clearly that this practice was known amongst the Jews. And uh, what we know is that they would chant a series of incantations, including the holy name of Jehovah, uh, in order to cast out these demons. But he tells us here that they added another name to that list. They added the name of Jesus. So these Jewish exorcists, by the way, who would these Jewish exorcists be? I would suggest to you they belonged to the sect of the Pharisees. The reason I say that is the Sadducees didn't believe in the supernatural. So they're not going to bother casting out demons because they don't believe such a thing exists. They don't believe in angels or spirits or any such thing. But the Pharisees did believe in all of those things. And so, no doubt, from the school of the Pharisees, and one of them, it seems, was a son of the chief priest. Is that what it says? He says, uh, these vagabond Jews, then it says, verse 14, they were the seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and she of the priests, which did so. Wow. Seven sons of one schemer. So obviously, considered to be greatly blessed, by the way, if you were a Jew and you had seven sons in your family, you were considered to be greatly, greatly blessed. So you've got seven sons, this chief priest, and it turns out there are a bunch of rogues. <laughs> they're vagabonds. That means they're traveling around. They don't have any fixed abode. And as they go in around, they're working their so-called magic, casting out demons, probably for a hefty fee and all the rest of it. And so that's what they're doing. But notice what it says. It says that they, simply it follows up verse 12, where from Paul, even handkerchiefs and aprons, diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. Then it says, certain of the vagabond Jews, they want to get in on the action. They see what Paul is doing. And so, how do they go about it? It tells us uh, that they, the seven sons of Sceva, they, they added the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you, this is verse 13, by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Now, I want to pause there and get sidetracked just for a minute. What was Paul known for? Preaching Jesus. They didn't say, Paul, the prophecy preacher, or the apologetics guy, or the church truth specialist. The overall tenor of what people understood about Paul's ministry was this. He preached Jesus. Isn't that good? 
Isn't that a, a lesson for any of us that take the platform? What should be our primary message? Preaching Jesus. And we better not get sidetracked from that. And so that's what he did. He preached Jesus. So they, they, they add this to the list. Preaching Jesus. And uh, what happens? Well, it tells us in verse 14. Sorry, verse 15. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? Wow. Even though they're sons of the chief priests, they weren't known in hell, in the powers of darkness, or ignorant of them. But on the radar screen of the powers of darkness were Jesus and Paul. Why? Because they were the biggest threat to them in the whole world. The message of Jesus and him crucified and people like Paul, who that's what they preached. This is where the threat comes from. And it's good to ask ourselves the question, I wonder... Do we constitute a threat to the domain of darkness? I don't believe we should be fascinated with demons or should be chasing them or, uh, you know, finding a demon or whatever. That's not our remit at all. It's preaching Jesus that got them on the radar screen uh, of, of these, uh, uh, the demonic world, Jesus and Paul. And so are we a threat to the powers of darkness? It's interesting that Leonard Ravenhill, who's an interesting preacher, but he said one of his goals was to be added to this list. Not only do they know Jesus and Paul, but they also know about Leonard Ravenhill. Well, that's a challenge, isn't it, to want to be on that list, because it's a dangerous list to be on, <laughs> because you become a real target for the evil one. You might be well known on earth, and have a reputation among men, but what of the infernal ones? Do we have any reputation there? That's the question we should ask. Notice verse 16, it says, the man whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. It was a pretty humiliating experience for them, wasn't it? The demonic world really made a big show of them. Running hastily out, naked and wounded, their pride perhaps took the biggest wounding of all. The amazing thing is that there's a worse fate ahead for people like this. The worst faith for them is given very clearly in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, because there are a lot of people that do things in Jesus' name, and he doesn't know them at all. Matthew 7, 21, it says, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work in the world. Isn't that amazing? That somehow through incantations and various things, people are able to cast out demons. <laughs> And there are, uh, we grew up in Catholicism, there are Catholic exorcists. That's what they do. But what a shock it will be for all of the things they're doing and doing it in his name that they will hear these terrible words. If art from me, they never knew you. You might be confused and thinking, well, why would the demons respond to these kind of things? Remember that the demon's number one thing is deception. So if a, a Pharisee can do it, it confirms people in that Pharisaical sect and keeps them away from Christ. If a Catholic priest does it, what does it do? It keeps people believing that false gospel 
and being ensnared in that evil system. That's all they care about. Their only interest is deception. And so they'll cooperate with these incantations because it forwards their cause in the world of great deception. And so there they are, humiliated in every way, and then all because they did not know the one who they were speaking about. They were talking about a Christ who Paul preached, but he wasn't a Christ who they knew. And it really comes down to this, isn't it? The bottom line is, do we know Christ? Do we have a personal relationship with him? Have we come admitting our sinfulness and our deserving of uh, an eternity in hell? Have we come calling on his name to save us, calling on the name of the Lord to be saved, believing that he died on that center cross as the substitute for sinners? Have we ever done that? Because that is what makes the difference. It's knowing Christ. And so notice he says in verse 17, it says, This was known that all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Or oh, how marvelous it was that he was so magnified in the city of Ephesus. But two more verses, uh, or a couple more verses I want to bring before us. Uh, verse 18, it says this, Many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of the Lord and prevailed. So many that believed, so they were already believers, but what they were doing is they were making a clean break with their old life. Well, it's a wonderful thing when believers make a clean break with their old life. But what was their old life like? Well, it was they were involved in all kinds of uh, occultic uh, activities, uh, so they, they got rid of them. They had the great Ephesian bonfire. By the way, it's interesting, you know, the people accuse Christians, you know, they'll say, well, you, know, you get into power or whatever, and you, you'll be having this, you know, like Hitler, burning books. Now, let me just give you, this is just nonsense how they say that. Hitler compelled the burning of books. He made the list. He did everything. These people, nobody is telling them to do this. They become new creatures. And because they become new creatures in Christ, they don't want that rich anymore. And they just do what's natural. They burn it because they don't, want, they don't want anybody else to have it either. 43 years ago, I was saved out of rock music scene. And I had a bonfire in my backyard. All my priceless albums. And they're probably, they won't be worth 50,000 pieces of silver, but they'd probably be worth a lot of money. If I kept them, because albums are back again. You, you know what I'm talking about, 33 RPM. And, and they're all my favorites. You know, they, they were all in there. Genesis, Pink Floyd, uh, Deep Purple. They all went in that fire. Because I knew that that life was gone. And there was no interest in it. And it's good, isn't it, to ask ourselves... Maybe we need to have a bonfire. I don't know what's in your house. But if it pulls you back to the old life, maybe it needs to go in the flames. If it keeps you back from making real progress spiritually, maybe you need a Springfield bonfire. There's a bonfire coming up, right? Just in having one. Take all your, all your stuff, you know, that is from the old life. Throw it on his bonfire. That would be a bonfire to remember, won't it? And by the way, there's a cost involved here, isn't there? 50,000 pieces of silver. By the way, many of these letters or these, these books that they brought, you know what they were called? They were known as the Ephesian letters. <clears throat> That's what they were known as. 
They, they were valuable, containing charms and incantations known to expel diseases and evil spirits, and they actually existed. They were called the Ephesian letters. And those Ephesian letters were burnt. And now we have some different Ephesian letters, don't we? We have the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. But all the riches that are mentioned in that letter compared to the dross that was in those letters that were burnt. And so he says, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Could it be that things that we're clinging onto give the enemy a foothold into our lives and hold us back from the word of the Lord growing and prevailing in our lives? It's challenging to think about, isn't it? Have I made a clean brain? Scripture says you're a new creature. Well, a new creature should have new desires, and the old desires should be gone. Anybody seen Christ? All things are passed away. All things have become new. So, by the way, this mightily grew the word of the Lord and prevailed is Luke's sixth progress report in the book of Acts. Six of them, as he's gone through what a wonderful thing it is. By the way, the Ephesian letters is not just a letter to the Ephesians. Second Timothy was an Ephesian letter as well. Timothy was in Ephesus when he got the letter. And also, um, Revelation 2, 1 through 7 is an Ephesian letter. So we've exchanged some bad Ephesian letters for some better Ephesian letters. The word of the Lord was magnified grew and prevailed. And so, again, do we take the lessons from this? And they're pretty serious lessons. Every single day, Paul was gossiping the gospel in the school of Tyrannus. All Asia came to hear the word of the Lord. The question, the challenge is knowing Jesus personally. Clearly, here are people going around casting out demons and they didn't know the Lord. And then finally, are the things from the old life that we're clinging on to. They're not also that prevent us from really magnifying the word of the Lord, making challenges with these thoughts this morning. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful for the word of God and for this uh, amazing chapter where uh, we love to read of these events where the Lord Jesus clearly is magnified. And that's our desire, Lord. We love him to be magnified in our lives. Paul would even pray that, that, that Christ would be magnified in his life, whether by life or by death. We pray that we would have that same desire to make the Savior look more significant in people's lives than he already is. Lord, we pray too for that clear break from that old life, that we might live for the Lord Jesus and serve him without distraction, because he surely is worthy. So we look to you to help us with these things. We thank you for the time we've had together. Thank you for a delightful Savior. Thank you for his work in conquering death and the grave. Thank you that he's risen, ascended, and seated at your right hand in majesty and glory. We thank you for these things. In the name of Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Yeah, yeah, amen.